This is Way 31 Law Call. Good evening and welcome to Way 31 Law Call. I'm Sharon Joviet. Tonight it's back to school night. We're talking about laws related to being back to school. Have your kids been back for a week or some, some schools been back about three weeks now? Call in your questions on everything from what to do if you've got a, a bullying situation in your school and the school's not doing anything about it. What if your child gets injured while at school? Do you have a lawsuit with that? How about talking about changing school zones if you and your ex are arguing over which schools the kids should go to? What can you do about that? School-related legal issues, call in the 31 Law Call number 256-536-0077. You can also now text to that same number, so if you're a little shy and don't want to go on the air, you can text in your question and we'll pull them out. You can also email a question any day of the week. You can send any legal question to lawcall at waytv.com and when we get to a show that's on point, we'll pull some out. We've got some of your email questions tonight. Getting us started tonight, Michael Timberlake's here from Timberlake League and Brooks. Good to have you back. Great to be here. Back to school time. You just got <laughs> your oldest off to college. Yes, I mean, you know, been, been down there with the U-Haul. <laughs> you know. Big change. Yes. Big change. Yes, it's, yes. It's, Kids yeah. growing up, everybody's got kids back to school. Before we start taking your questions and we get the first callers locked in, we've got tonight's You Make the Law Call clip. So we pulled some video off of YouTube. It looks like a beautiful day for going out, taking a walk, taking a drive. Okay, he's he's going to be just fine. But watch what happens over here to the left. Oh. And it's not over yet. Hold on, you're going to see it come right back. Holy cow. Okay, so it, we're going to play it over again. It looks like the guy coming from the left runs the light, maybe. Let's look at it again. So, well, bless the pedestrian's heart. Yeah, uh, thank you know, goodness I mean, I'm sure he's, okay. he's scared to death. If somebody, if that's what's happening here, somebody running a light, is there any legal defense for running a light? Can you? I mean, you really can't. You know, it's, you know, clearly the, it's an intersection situation, so you've got the traffic control device con controls the intersection, and you've got to, you know, monitor the traffic control device. So um, the, the car that was at fault for running through the, the light is going to be at fault not only for, you know, injuries to the car that they immediately hit, uh, but they're also going to be uh, responsible for injuries and damages to any other car that the other car hit, like the, the car that was going the other direction where the yeah. car ended up on its <laughs> roof. Um, yeah. You know, so, so you're going to have um, responsibility for all of those people in that situation. Um, you know, where it gets complicated is you've got one person that's caused injury to potentially three other people, um, and then how is that going to work out? Um, you know, insurance policies are typically written in, in you know, they're, they're increasing amounts. So you have a twenty-five fifty policy, twenty-five thousand dollar fifty thousand policy, fifty one hundred thousand dollar policy, or you know, two fifty five hundred. Okay. So what it means is that so you've got a twenty five thousand dollar per person limit that they will pay, okay. or fifty thousand dollar aggregate total. Total. So in this situation where you got potentially three people yeah, that are going to be there, you don't have twenty-five thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand, twenty-five thousand. You only have fifty total, okay. and no one person can get more okay. than twenty-five. So it really, you know, the the insurance is limited in that situation. So the more people you have involved in it, uh, kind of the more difficult it is, and the more uh, complicated it is to recover. So if the insurance company says, okay, yeah, you've got at least fifty thousand dollars worth of damages here. Take it, it, and they're going to go here. Here, <laughs> take the here, fifty thousand. Take, take our money. How does it get divided out between the different people? Well, it's the it, most hurt. Yeah, no. it, it typically is is one of those things where we either you know can work together with the other counsel for the other people, or, or uh, directly with the injured people, or the insurance company has an opportunity to interplead the money, which is just pay it into court and say, hey, we owe all this money. Y'all figure out how to divide it, or let the court uh, figure out how to divide it. Okay. Under those circumstances. Would they ever just say, okay, this person's really hurt and this one's not hurt so much, so we're just going to give it all to one person? Um, or do they try and wait, balance it? Potentially, but then they're going to, if they if they pay out all the money um, to one person and then somebody else has a claim that's a, that's an excess of their policy mm -hmm. limits, then they can really put their insured in a box and say, because then the, the person that is responsible is personally responsible. Their insurance has all been paid out. Um, not to their, you know, not at their direction, um, and then the insurance company can be on the hook for anything in excess of the okay. limits. Okay. 
It gets complicated. Yes, it does. So tonight we're talking about back to school, um, injuries that might be related to back to school, and legal actions that might be related to back to school. Let's talk a little bit about teacher are teachers immune? So they're doing their job. If something happens on their watch, how, how much protection do they have because this is their job? Yeah, I mean, teachers in Alabama have a lot of protection. They have what we call uh, state agent dis uh, discretionary immunity or state agent immunity, which means in general, they are a sovereign, you know, the, the state cannot be sued. Um, and so they are agents of the state. So in most situations, it can be very difficult to sue. You know, you can't sue the state, but if you sue the teacher individually, uh, in most situations, they have what's called discretionary immunity and what that means is as long as they are doing something um, you know there as long as they don't do something that violates a bright line rule a specific direction um, in their in, either in their employment contract or in their policies and procedures if they're doing something that's discretionary in their job then they have immunity then you cannot sue them um, and it can you know so it, and that's a lot of what teachers do it's yeah. a, it's basically a judgment call defense if they're okay. doing something that they have to exercise judgment a lot of times they are immune Okay. You see stories sometimes where some teacher gets the wild idea to tie a student in a chair or something like that because they, they keep getting up. That seems like that crosses a line. The, the, those are the things that, that when it gets to intentional conduct okay. or our quasi-intentional conduct or just, you know, if they just clearly disobey the rules, the written rules of the school or the state um, when they're doing their job, they can be individually liable for, for their actions. Um, the AEA, the Alabama Education Administration, the teachers union, uh, typically provides coverage or defenses for those folks uh, that are union members and you can deal with that and so there can be insurance and, and lawyers involved in those types of situations uh, but you know you're always going to face this issue about well was their action you know discretionary um, or is there something that you could you know move against the teacher on? Yeah punishments have changed a lot in schools since our day right? Not a, yeah, whole, not a whole lot of spanking uh, in they, schools or they, physical they, punishment. They, there's anymore. a whole lot of different uh, types of things they can do um, and with that comes a lot of rules in terms of specific direction about the way teachers can handle themselves, the way they can handle disrupt, uh, disruptive students. Uh, I think it's good for the teachers because it provides them clear direction. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, you know, it is a lot different than the, what it was when we, <laughs> when we were around. Yeah. The 31 law call number 256-536-0077. You can also text to that number. We got in an email question. This was from Lisa. Lisa says, can the school be held liable if my child is injured by another student during school hours? You know, the school, it it's kind of comes back to what we were just talking about. So the, another student injures your student, then your first claim would be against that other student, you know, and directly against that student, regardless of whether that child is a minor or not. If the child's a minor, you can still, you know, yeah, file claim against that student uh, for the their actions and um, in, you know a lot of times um, you know there there can be successful claims under those situations um, the then you look at you know is the school responsible was there lack of supervision was there a setup situation uh, so that the teacher or the school administration knew or should have known that this was going to happen and they didn't take action if you can prove that um, then you may be able to make a claim uh, against the school but uh, but the primary claims can be against the principal wrongdoer how would you prove that the school knew something is likely to happen um, you know you would have to look you know again you go back to you know what are their records you know what what do they have you have to have some information to indicate that they this was an ongoing problem sometimes that just comes from repeated you know instances of people having problems with one child and going to the administration and trying to take care of it and having um, you know that stop problem not being resolved um, and if it happens over and over and over again then that leads to uh, you know potential liability for the school administration or the board okay talk about who would pay so you're saying if the if one student injures another student you could bring a claim or a lawsuit for your child right. and you'd be suing sure. the other child right right that's how you file it <laughs> what are you going to yeah. get yeah. I mean, do you get money well, from the child or from the parents 
typically, um, if if there's uh, if it's a situation where there's not necessarily intentional conduct, or you can look at the conduct and say that it was uh, that this was you know potentially reckless conduct or, or careless conduct, but wasn't intentional, you can then look to the, the child's. Uh, potential homeowners insurance policy that they would have uh, with their house. So if their parents own a home and have to have insurance on the home, there is a liability insurance rider or policy or, or as part of the policy that would potentially provide coverage for the child for careless or even reckless acts uh, or injuries to somebody else, even though they're not in their home or, or on their property. If they're outside that property, the, the policy still provides uh, for coverage in that situation. But if they did it on purpose, you're saying the insurance probably wouldn't cover it. So. Most insurance companies or most insurance policies that are written like this will cover, you know, reckless conduct, careless conduct, okay. but intentional conduct. If there's something that, that you know, is directly intentional conduct, okay. there are exclusions for that. And that becomes kind of a gray area. Will the insurance company cover that? T typically, if a, there's a question about whether there's coverage, an insurance company will send the wrongdoer or send the potential wrongdoer they're insured uh, a letter saying look um, we've got a potential you know situation here where we would not extend coverage to you uh, so we're going to provide coverage to you or provide um, you know a, a defense to you hire an attorney for you under what is called a reservation of rights and simply what that means is that the insurance company is going to do what they should would do normally in a situation uh, short of paying out money um, and they're going to investigate the, the situation and if it determines that they have coverage then they will go ahead and pay or, or extend the coverage to you if they're determined they there's not coverage then you're not put in a bad position because you relied on them you would still have counsel uh, up until the point where they denied the coverage we got in a text uh, parent writing in, my child's in a local high school band. During a recent band parent meeting, it was stated that if the parents don't sign up to work on the concessions, that the director would pull the student and make the student work concessions during the game instead of allowing the student to play with the band during the game. Is that legal? <laughs> you didn't sign up to, to work concessions. You signed up to play in the band. Well, you know, I Can you don't, do that? I, you know, a, a lot of it depends on, you know, what, what the situation is in terms of what the booster situation. I don't think that's probably kosher in terms of what the band, uh, the, the situation with the school is. Um, the, uh, you know, the students should have an opportunity to, uh, to play um, and, you know, and perform, you know, if they uh, live up to their end of the bargain, just because a parent doesn't, you know, can't or won't, you know, in engage in uh, the booster program, I don't think it should have any impact on that student. So basically, you're unfairly discriminating against a student who's done everything right uh, because their parents aren't willing to participate, and that's not really fair to the kid. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back answering more of your questions. We've got some more text coming in. Uh, back to school questions. Stay with us. You're watching Way 31 Law Call. Your rights, your calls, live. Presented by the Tennessee Valley's award-winning personal injury and wrongful death law firm, Timberlake, League, and Brooks. Featuring the knowledge and experience of Attorney Michael Timberlake, Attorney Will League, Attorney Heath Brooks, Attorney William Maservi, and hosted by broadcaster and family law attorney Sharon Doviet. This is Way 31 Law Call. Okay. Welcome back to 31 Law Call. Tonight we're talking about back to school issues. The law call number, call in 536-0077. You can also text to that number. Um, an ongoing case, uh, virtual school signups that w was not a real school. Well, yeah, and it happened during, there was, you know, we had an issue during um, the, the pandemic where you had uh, some, you know, superintendents, principals, you know, administration of schools uh, in North Alabama, and what they were doing is they were getting federal, state funds uh, for kids to sign up for these virtual programs, and they were releasing the, the kids, uh, they were taking the information they had through the state and using that information to sign these kids up and getting the tuition 
but not providing any services for the kids. <laughs> That's uh, an easy way to make yeah, money. Yeah, so, uh, you know, and a lot of it was criminal activity, and you have a lot of these wow. folks that have gone, um, you know, that have, that have gone through prison or have plea deals or, or and have been prosecuted criminally. Uh, we're pursuing claims civilly for the, you know, the identity theft, the problems that they've got, like well, taking these kids' identity, using it for their own good. Uh, their own good. Uh, and so we're, that's been ongoing for a while, and it's, it's deep into discovery, and we'll see how it goes. Very interesting. We also wanted to remind people about you've got the Race for Justice coming up. Yes, yeah, the Race for Justice, and this is a, um, this is a, a program through the Madison County Volunteer Law Pro, uh, Lawyer Program, and it's a great program that basically uh, takes pro bono cases and assigns them to private practice lawyers um, that are willing to donate their time to take care of people and they do all kinds of civil cases um, you know criminal lawyers are appointed for you by the court this is this is not that this is civil lawyers uh, that are spending their time to take care of people uh, that can't afford lawyers uh, they've got a, their big fundraiser is uh, on Labor Day and it's the race for justice um, if you are uh, inclined to, to get out and run and do your thing um, you know please please register it's a great race good times and uh, it's coming up here in the near future and we'll, we'll be there and we're excited excellent. about it excellent okay we got in a text can parents contest with the city if a teacher falsely writes up a student after another teacher confirms to the parent that the situation was mistaken identity no. What can you do? What yeah, do you, I mean, what do you recommend? You know, you, you're basically, you go through the, the hierarchy there. You know, okay. you go through, you address it with the administration of the school. Um, if you can't get to where you want to be with the administration of the school, then you take it up uh, to the school board and school board, uh, you know, the the superintendent um, you work through the system and, and then if you can't get your answer to the superintendent then you take it up with your school board member uh, but really you know the the idea is to be um, calm cool and collected through the process um, typically the people that um, th that are that are hysterical about things like this uh, cause more problems for themselves than they create uh, you know so you know then they solve so it's a really s a situation where you want to make sure that you do everything you can to take care of your kid uh, but go through the right channels and make sure it gets processed correctly okay let's talk a little bit about sports injuries right. if kids are out playing uh, sports with their their schools if they get injured while they're out there is that the same kind of injury that we're talking can insurance cover something like that or where does that fall you know most of those injuries would fall under what we call assumption of the risk okay. that you're assuming the risk uh, of injury by engaging in a certain activity um, now if there is something uh, unusual about the the activity uh, uh, maybe intentional maybe something that was you know after the whistle if there was something that was uh, could be deemed something other than that a risk that you didn't assume then that's a potential actionable thing um, we have seen claims against trainers or doctors or uh, potentially for that that are treating on field injuries uh, a lot of times those can be difficult because uh, you're dealing with a traumatic situation and um, these trainers or doctors are typically donating their time uh, as volunteers and so there can be protections uh, afforded to them in those in that capacity uh, but uh, in general sports related injuries are typically uh, not anything that we see in the personal injury world very often. Okay, what if you are the, the, the visitor, you're there watching and something happens to you? Maybe whether it's the ball flies out of the park and it, it uh, cracks your windshield right, or right. it hits you in the face while you're sitting there watching and you're injured, are you assuming the risk by being there? You know, we used to, like when, when I was in law school, we, we talked about that, you know, that you'd look at the back of the ticket and it would have a big disclaimer on there that, you know, <laughs> yeah. by, not you know, responsible by, you know for, not responsible for anything, yeah. you know, yeah. it, but, but if you're, uh, you know, you know, by purpose of, uh, you know, virtue of this ticket, you know, we're not, uh, you're releasing us from any liability for any, you know, Real, you know, sports-related hazards. Um, that is, you know, typically, you know, we don't have tickets anymore, <laughs> so um, yeah. that's not, you know, typically something you see. But in general, it is the same uh, as, you know, an activity that you assume the risk of. So that if you're at a baseball game uh, and you get hit by a baseball, that's something that that you know could happen. You voluntarily assume that risk uh, when you go there and, and go, you know, and participate. Um, now, if you're behind the fence and there's a big hole in the fence, that's a different story. Oh, you know. okay. 
that might be an, an opportunity to do something. Yeah. We had talked a little bit about uh, school zones, and we were talking about kids going back to school, and school sure. zones in an area that falls into family law, which I do. People are oftentimes asking, what if I disagree and I want my child to go to my school zone after the divorce? and my ex wants the child to go to their school zone, how do we figure that out? Yeah, I mean, how do the school, I mean, the schools, you know, they, they, you know, they basically have two parents that they yeah. have to answer to in that situation. Yes. So what, what does the school do, or, or, or do they have to offer them to go to either school, and then who makes the decision? So generally the order will include in there some orders about who is assigned ultimate decision making for, for various areas, medical, educational so if, if you're going through a divorce one of the things that you may want to be thinking ahead of is is that area important to you do you want to be the one that's in charge of ultimate decision making for education and you that parent would likely be the one that's going to get to choose which school zone they go to alternately you can write in the language to a divorce settlement that you the parents agree the child will go to such and such school zone for so long as either parent resides there and mm -hmm. if, if neither parent resides there then here's the backup plan so you can take away some of that power from the other parent if you plan ahead for it right, so right. talk to your lawyer about well, that and you know and that gives you and it gives you basically options and you know yeah. if you've got you can be in one school zone or the other school zone depending upon you know what they can agree on and that um, depending on where you live that may you know, one school zone may have a better option than another one. So that's a, a great point that you need to, you know, pay attention to if you're going through a divorce. Okay, you've got the college kid going away, and you've you've uh, wanted to... Well, he made it to his first semester. Start. He did not get arrested, and he made good grades. Excellent. Over that's the, why, that was, that was that's all, all that you need. Yes, yes. Over the age of 19, though, you're paying all the bills, but a little surprise for folks out there that yeah, you think you're going to be in control. Yeah, they, the one thing at orientation, they, they, they made it very <laughs> clear, is that because your child, uh, if your child is over 19 years of old of age, he, he or she is of the age of majority in Alabama. And that means that you as a parent no longer have the power over him uh, or her to get all their information. So their health care related information, their grade related information, even their billing information for the school that you're paying for, you have to have the child, or not the child, <laughs> you have to have your child, who is now an adult, permission uh, to give you that information so that you can find out how much you have to pay them, what the grades were, uh, you know, and if they're going to class. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. A little different. You've got an adult on your hands. I know. It's, just, gonna, it's absurd. We're going to take a break. Be right back. Answer more of your questions about back to school. Stay with us. If you didn't get your questions answered tonight, here's how to get in touch. Michael Timberlake with Timberlake League and Brooks in Huntsville. They are personal injury attorneys, so that's everything from car accidents to medical malpractice. 256-536-0770 or 800-804-2502. The website is law-injury.com, and if you like them on Facebook, you can learn more about the law that way. And Sharon practices family law in North Alabama. She does a great job of all things child Thank custody, you. divorce, um, anything child-related, family law related 256-539-7337 or SharonFamilyLaw.com. Thank you. Thanks for all your calls and questions. Glad everybody's back to school safe. Have a good week.